please, this is going to be pretty informal. There's going to be a lot of back and forth. So if you do have a question, uh, even when people are giving their introductions or something like that, please raise your hand. Um, we might hold your question for a moment so that we can get through everybody's introductions, but please feel free to you know jump right in. So, um, Matt, you want to start? <coughs> Okay, so um, my name is Matthew Johnson. Um, I'm a founder and co-partner of a brand new uh, studio called Super Duper Studio. Um, working with a with a an old classmate of mine, we just finished our Masters of Fine Arts in Industrial Design at CCA, um, and we are focusing on um, home home decor products, lighting, uh, specifically. Um, using uh, digital manufacturing technologies to produce objects that are at once um, uh, unique but fit into a family and a sort of mass manufacture um, business model. My name is Tony Mirzwinski. I'm with Two Jack Stenham here in Oakland. I'm a retailer. I don't currently make anything, but I do purchase products from local uh, makers and producers, and all of the goods sold in my store are made in the USA. So I have a real vested interest, um, personally, professionally, and ethically in local manufacturing. And about to make things in my own. I'm Hiroko, I co-founded, well, I founded and now I'm co-director of the 25th Street Collective between Broadway and Telegraph here. And we're uh, basically a sustainable business incubator of sewn goods, uh, artists and producers, and we share on-site uh, sewing production and provide sample development prototyping, and really trying to focus with a group of artisans who I refer to as nano enterprisers, <laughs> um, and then helping support their growth. And one of the ways that we do that is by sharing a manufacturing license by forming like an unincorporated association with the state. Um, and that helps save a lot of uh, money and time um, and then sort of demonstrates, you know, just our approach in sharing our resources and our space. Um, and wanting to now take a hundred year old profession and bringing high tech to it so that we can move towards a non inventory based model and do uh, sort of mini mass customization, if you will, mm -hmm. in major order. Hi, everybody. My name is Eloisa. I'm the founder of Bay Thread. I'm also in the apparel sector, and my company works with startup designers and develops pattern making services, grading, um, manufacturing services at a low minimum. We currently outsource all of our sewing to local manufacturers in the Oakland area and in San Francisco. And uh, just real quick, I'm, I'm Jeffrey McGrew, and uh, I'm from a company here in Oakland called Because We Can, we're a design build architecture studio. So we do the traditional architecture interior design sorts of things, but we have an in-house CNC shop. So we have a pair of giant CNC routers that we're going to make things for our own projects. So we just did a bar in San Francisco for the Long Now Foundation. And so we did all the design work, and then we actually physically made like the bar and furniture and seating and various things that went into the project. So, um, so sometimes we'll do product runs as well, uh, where you know if there's a product that we really like, we might make like a couple dozen of them and just sell them online or something like that, depending on how busy the shop is. But lately, we've just been more on the kind of bespoke production side of things. So, who here in the audience also has a business that physically makes things? Anybody? Here, what What do you do? Um, I turn single-family homes into collective buildings. Oh, fantastic! What's, yeah. the, name, what's the name of your company? Zo Dwellings. Zo Dwellings. Oh, I know Zo Dwellings. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Who, who, uh, who else? Is anybody else in the room uh, have a business that makes things? No. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't, but I have a friend who is a bespoke tailor. Oh, okay. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's um, uh, just to you know, kind of keep the conversation going. Uh, Let's, we'll start on this end of the table. I'll pass the mic back this way. Um, if, you could, if you could just talk really briefly what inspired you to start the business that you did uh, and some of the uh, uh, 
you know, what inspired you to start the business that you did, and what are some of the things you're currently kind of struggling with in terms of the local production? Like we were talking earlier about how some of the local sewing production facilities are kind of dying out, you know, and, and so you're having problems trying to find local people to support, support your business activities. So in 2009, my first venture was to start an apparel dress line, so I was on the opposite side of the coin. I knew and had the pattern making skills, but as a small business owner, I had to wear many hats, and the first thing I wanted to do <laughs> was um, outsource the pattern making. And I had a very difficult time finding a pattern maker that um, could see my vision and, and produce the product that I really wanted. And then my second obstacle was um, meeting manufacturer minimums of 100 or 200 units per style. Um, I did not want to carry that much inventory, especially of the same garment. So I was willing to do 200 piece runs, but I wanted to do five styles, not just one. And um, I just really went in there and talked to all the manufacturers that I had previous relationships because I was working for companies like Levi's and EGG and Margaret O'Leary before I ventured out on my own. So I had some ties to the local um, contract sewers and the factories. And I just really negotiated and um, asked them to help me out, and they did. So when that venture, I decided to stop that venture, I started thinking of these obstacles and I really wanted to help entrepreneurs like myself and aspiring designers with the knowledge that I have because most of them um, never really see their dreams come true because it is a very tough industry and you need a lot of experience and knowledge to, to get your product out into the market. Um, and some of the challenges that I see now is that as my business grows, I need more help in manufacturing and the sewing portion of, of the process. And in the Bay Area, um, the seamstresses are just retiring and we're not getting a new um, group of people with the same type of skill. Um, you don't see the issue so much in Los Angeles because there is the Hispanic community and they're, they're still um, out there and they're, they're very skilled, but factories here in San Francisco and in um, Oakland and the Bay Area overall are just closing. So that has been one of the biggest hurdles that, I have, that I've had to overcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it seems like a really common trend, uh, at least that I've experienced from talking with smaller manufacturing companies, is, is that they're kind of, at least initially out of the gate, optimizing for freedom. You know, like you said, that you wanted to do these various lines, but you didn't want to meet you know, the minimum standards for us in terms of like the, when we've done furniture products before, if we tried to approach like a major retailer, the deal would be so bad for us, you know, from the major retailer that it doesn't make any sense for us to try to get furniture into like a major store. And also they, you know, there'd be a lot of standards for what they would want us to make, you know, where we want to make the stuff we want to make, right? And so instead we have to find other, other ways to get to that same, you know, sales and, and spot. And have it ready in two days. I have it ready in two days, right? <laughs> so how about you, what, what inspired you to start what you did, and uh, what are some of the struggles that you're facing? So, um, although I hold a textile design degree, I ended up working in the nonprofit sector in economic development, and so my goal always had been, as I moved um, into what I call being a reluctant capitalist <laughs> by incorporating <laughs> social responsibility in my wool blanket company. And so as that grew, um, actually, it was architecture that um, inspired me to launch the 25th Street Collective because I walked by this amazingly beautiful vintage warehouse building in the Uptown Arts District and you know, literally saw the light from all the skylights. I'm like, okay, so how do I get my studio here? And four months, six months later, I found myself on the lease with um, a winery, a local wine production house, and then proceeded to fill the space with other artists and producers using the same equipment, similar equipment, and um, in that process started another business and, um, you know, continue to find myself laying the infrastructure for growing my blanket company, which somehow, you know, still exists and is uh, <laughs> growing, but um, now moving the, um, the capacities of having on-site production to now sourcing wool responsibly from a bioregional perspective. And so I personally have moved to Sonoma County and working at a wool mill mm -hmm. to develop the infrastructure there of 
you know, getting wool and sustainable cottons and now hemp uh, into a whole production system. And as I mentioned earlier, and, and what you're alluding to is, you know, basically a generation of manufacturing professionals who, you know, at the same time with the larger companies have been pushed offshore for most of the labor um, capacity and have also grown to the point where, you know, they've worked really hard, they've sent their kids to UC, and now they want to sort of retire into, you know, grandparentship, right? And um, how do we bring education to uh, a new generation of people who want to make things? And the way I'm seeing that happen is the only way to do that here and in villages, in India, Mexico, wherever, is to offer ownership in a factory or uh, having equity stake while at the same time being able to offer entrepreneurship mm -hmm. so that as somebody comes in to be trained in, in, in a very highly skilled uh, part, um, which we take for granted because we you know, are told that we want to spend five, ten dollars on a t-shirt, right? Is, um, is to bring that opportunity for ownership and again entrepreneurship if that's something that somebody wants. Um, so that's sort of the bigger picture. And then I think the other challenge <coughs> in sharing this space was evident because what we're seeing as artists come in and First Friday starts to build up the, the economy here in Oakland again, um, you know, it's hard to create a product that actually reflects the true cost of things and not create an elite class that can only access them. Mm -hmm. And so that becomes like a real big issue for me too. And, um, you know, not just wanting to incorporate technology in the production modality, but also in the accessibility modality. So using marketing as creating movements towards education around what it really takes to make something. And how can we convince people not just through consumer marketing, but through you know a, a movement towards education in buying into what you believe in. <coughs> so if you know that a t-shirt takes really forty-eight dollars worth of labor and good materials, you know, responsibly sourced materials, uh, forty-eight to sixty dollars. We're working with Oaklandish right now on a wool t-shirt. Um, how can one say, well? Instead of being proud of spending ten dollars for a T-shirt, say, you know what? I'm really proud to be able to spend ten dollars over four months or five months for this T-shirt, and I'm going to be able to go online and have it fit me properly. Where I can choose the design. So those are sort of my big challenges I'm trying to address. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I think the question was, how did I get into this? Well, I had a whole, <laughs> I had a whole lifetime in the corporate world, and I was uh, discarded in. 2011, and decided that uh, after looking for a job for a year, decided that I had to create my own because no one, no one was going to hire me because of my age and and my uh, my formal former title. Uh, you know, it just put me out of the job market. And I had always been um, interested in clothes, clothing and half Italian. You know, what the hell be doing that type of thing. <laughs> and uh, you know, my, my grandfather always wore a really nice wool suit, three-piece suit, and fedora. And um, so I, I guess that was incorporated in my DNA. And um, I, uh, I had a lot of different business ideas that I ran up the black pole, and um, none of them really stuck like this one did. And um, my business is based on a platform of three things, and that's uh, made in America, which I think is really important. We're here to talk about local manufacturing, and that's what it's all about, a made in America. And uh, menswear, menswear is coming back into its own again. There are men menswear boutiques. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know, denim, denim is uh, part of the American culture. It's not going to go anywhere. And uh, there is, in, in, uh, the other factor is the whole artisanal movement. And I like to call uh, the products that I carry artisanal products because they are made by uh, designers. It's small batch production, like small batch bourbon, small batch denim. <laughs> 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 that's, that's my analogy. And uh, 
as far as the uh, local manufacturing angle, you know, I purchase some products that are made locally, and I'm uh, eager to get more products that are that are made locally. And I, I see um, a lot of forces putting pressure on local manufacturing here in Oakland as we go through yet another phase of gentrification. There, uh, you know, there's just rising property values. There's uh, a big uh, apartment rush from San Francisco, people coming here to live in Oakland because for the time being, and I think that time may have already passed, it is less expensive. Um, but, uh, you know, this warehouse that Roko's in on 25th Street, um, how long is that going to be available as a warehouse? As, as the landlords get pressure, um, you know, they may have owned the building for 30 years and they want to retire, so what's the best way to catch out? It's not to sell it to, an, uh, to rent to, to an arts collective, it's to sell it to the developers. And already we've lost um, a lot of the warehouse space in Oakland. West Oakland, um, you know, there, there's, there's some left there, but that's going fast too from the developers. Um, Thank God we have things like uh, American Steel, and and there's uh, another uh, facility over um, on 16th where a lot of uh, makers work as well. So um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of pressure, and I, and I think that we need local manufacturing as a as a backbone to to the Oakland economy. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I'll save it for the next. <laughs> All right, um, so this is a, a little bit of a difficult question for me to answer because my business is really only about four or five months old. Um, so I'm, I'm really starting, or I, I'm really still learning about uh, you know, how, how this whole process is gonna unfold and, and what it might mean in the long run. But I can say that um, my, my uh, co-founder partner and I, um, his name is Chris Yamane, uh, we both became super interested while we were in school in, in uh, digital manufacturing techniques. And, and when I talk about that, I, I'm talking about CNC uh, routers, CNC lathes, um, laser cutters, um, and then ultimately, uh, maybe not now, but in the near future, 3D printers. Um, and, and what we see with these new technologies relates a little bit to what Hiroko was saying about this idea of, of ownership um, the opportunity to become an entrepreneur, uh, an owner of a business, and and stay as a designer. Um, Chris and I realized when we got our first MakerBot uh, 3D printer that all of a sudden now we could just go ahead and sort of replace all the all the tooling costs, all the dies, all the all the upfront um, investment required to manufacture products in China with uh, a much less expensive, much more flexible set of tools um, like the ones that I mentioned before. And ultimately what we think we can do with these types of tools is to design products like uh, home decor or lighting objects, um, sort of bespoke products which fit in between a set of constraints. So when we design a product, um, it could be, uh, the form could relate to a spectrum over here, or it could relate to this sort of spectrum of constraints over here, but every time we load that product into the machine to have it be produced, um, our, our sort of designed algorithm or, or procedure um, or process will allow that object to come out unique every single time. Um, it, it, the, the process of manufacturing with some of these new digital tools um, allows us to sort of escape that, that Fordist paradigm that demands um, incredible investment up front, um, demands that there is inventory management, that uh, the demand for the product is kind of ginned up in order to keep the factory running. Um, we think that we can escape, escape from those constraints and, and end up ultimately producing products that are singular and, and very meaningful for the individual consumer that purchased it. Um, this is all kind of very abstract right now, and, and this is this idea of uh, mass customization that people have been struggling with for some time. Um, but in the end, we think that uh, it's really an opportunity also in, in the larger sense to, to um, 
question the ethics of consumption and, and the ethics of um, uh, the sort of capital labor dynamic um, whereby small dispersed manufacturers with teams of 10, 20 people can be producing the same types of things that Shenzhen is producing now. Um, and and the, the local economy, I think that's a really important idea. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd love to open things up some uh, and start kind of a back and forth with the audience a little bit, if that's okay. Um, anybody have any initial questions before I start throwing topics out to open everything up to? Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, offshoring is slowing down and we might be entering into a new realm of uh, onshoring? So did everybody hear that? Everybody hear that question? You have a good voice, so yeah. <laughs> um, you open it up to the panel real quick. Um, I, I think the slowdown is inevitable. Um, what will force it is uh, is it's going to be interesting to see. We already see unrest over in China, in Hong Kong. People are are uh, revolting in the streets and. Um, you know, there's a big trade imbalance with, with China, and also wages are going up in China. <coughs> However, you know, the shift has happened in our national economy. We are a, a, a service-based economy and a nation of people addicted to cheap goods. So, um, in order in order for that shift to change, I think the small urban manufacturing has to increase. Um, but with that, it has to come a consumer awareness of, um, of the value of, of the fact that every time you take out your wallet and put some money on the counter, you're making a political and economic and, uh, and an ethical uh, uh, statement. In, in terms of like the total uh, cost of ownership? In, it, well, uh, you, are you talking <coughs> about the manufacturing or in, in, the, 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 from the, the consumer the, point of view? Consumer point of view, which would then have ramifications for the manufacturing realm. Yeah, I, I, I think the two the two go hand in hand. If we can increase that that consciousness, you know, around the world, made in America still has a very valuable cachet. Um, one of the denim suppliers that I use, Telus, and they're out of San Francisco. Um, their largest market is Japan. So I think that that's that's an untapped area is exporting. And if we can really grow small urban manufacturing, we're right here in Oakland. The port's right down the street. Right. We don't have any transportation costs. Yeah. There is a market for our goods overseas. One well, and just two two things uh, with your question. America still makes a hell of a lot of stuff, right? But what it makes is like jet engines and giant bulldozers. <laughs> like these aren't commodity goods by any means. It's still making very niche goods. And in that area of the niche goods, you do see more onshoring happening. Like Tesla just put their battery plant in Reno because their time to iterate on the design is so critical to them that trying to build a giant factory overseas somewhere where they have less control over the whole process and can't turn around as quickly as things are changing um, wouldn't work for their business at all. Right? Well, companies so like Ikea yeah. are also setting up in the Midwest right. to produce. Well, and I think specifically like, because of shipping costs. Exactly. Like, mm -hmm. like the carbon tax that's coming down the road. Right. Literally, right. you know. And I think have Toyota, companies like Levi's yeah, actually and preparing a second bottom line that they don't uh -huh. print right. that's already incorporating that carbon tax. Right. And so I think yeah. like Toyota, Toyota Tacoma pickup ironically has a five percent inch has m is more made in America than any other pickup uh, that you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so it's, it's an interesting thing, but uh, but there are a lot of challenges as well. Um, like you were saying, like you know, one thing that I struggle with uh, in the fact that we can make furniture is, and you bring up IKEA, is it's like, well, okay, IKEA is you know able to make a chair for like, you know, if you go online and you buy a chair off of Amazon that costs like five bucks, somebody in that model is getting exploited, right? Because there's somebody's no way, yeah, somebody's paying for it, and that cost is just hidden from you, right? And so how how does that work in a way where it's not exploitative? Right? I mean, even if it says made in the USA, uh, and there is a town in China called Musa, by the way. <laughs> 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 oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It doesn't 
guarantee a living wage. Just because it says made in America doesn't mean that person right. is struggling right. at, you know, minimum wage. It right. just perpetuates. Uh, let's see. Do we need, do we need Mark? No, I don't think, if, if everybody can hear, I'll just repeat the question if, if people can't. Okay. But, uh, but I think actually he had his hand up before everybody else. If you still want to ask your question? Um, yeah, I would just wonder, um, I think there's a issue of like, parochialism that could come into local manufacturing. What's that? Sorry, I don't know um, It's just sort of, uh, you know, more focused on yourselves than on other people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like sort of a competitive uh, marketplace. Uh, aspect, and I guess mm -hmm. maybe not as globally focused. Right. It's, uh, right. Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's a good point. I mean, one thing that we see uh, with some of the digital fabrication tools getting more and more uh, affordable, so more and more people can buy them and start doing, making products for their regional markets, I, we see that potentially what might happen is a shift to like, you know, 100 years ago, if you bought a toilet, if you bought a, like, a toilet plunger in New York, it was made by some factory that was near there. And if you bought one in LA, it was made by some other factory, right? And they were different. And so you had a lot more like local regional variation in the products that were available to you. Uh, and all of that kind of washed away over the last hundred years. And, and I think for some products, not for everything, but I think for some, some of that might actually come back. You know, like Levi's were invented in San Francisco and denim jeans were like a West Coast phenomenon back in the 1800s. And I remember reading where like, you know, people from New York would come out to the West Coast and then bring back real cowboy pants. Uh, you know, that were actual denim. It was like a big deal, like in the 1800s, to have the real, to have the real, you know, denim, denim pants. So like, so I feel like, you know, with some of the, uh, some of the production becoming more democratic, we'll, we'll see a lot more local variation happening. You know, um, and so it's all relevant. I mean, oh yeah, your sourcing is going to be produced sustainably in other parts of the world. You know, like we're not going to be able to house all the sheep we need for everybody to have the best fiber in the world mm -hmm. as part of their, you know, clothing. <laughs> right. 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 But, you know, no, no. we're going to continue to source probably more from New Zealand than Australia because New Zealand has better practices already in place. So it I is, think. it's, it's relevant, or it's, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. depending on where you define regional and local. Right. Like most of the materials that we utilize for um, the furniture and stuff that we're making comes from the Pacific Northwest. So we're getting plywood that's made in Oregon and Washington and shipped here. Um, so we're not using stuff that's being made. Like so, it depends on your definition of local, mm -hmm. you know, and, and regional. So uh, you, you, and then you. Is that okay? <laughs> okay sorry, I just want to make sure we get everybody. So Me, yeah. Okay. Um, as far as a generation, and not only the younger generation, all of us have been taught, in some sense, to expect to be able to throw something away in six months. Um, have something inexpensive that it's, it's a waste society. Mm -hmm. And I think especially pertinent to the nanopreneur, if you will, who's trying to um, change that, re-educate us all to understand the difference between what wool feels like and what polyester feels like mm -hmm. and why it's important. And so I wonder if, if there's an approach to multiple lines, like the signature line, on, on, at the top, the bespoke line lives in one level, but then do you create something that mm -hmm. is the transition? Right, not even the transition, but all the way down. Yes, I would see yeah. um, two or three levels. One being have a taste. Mm -hmm. Even if it, I hope it's not a lost leader, but the concept of, of giving someone an experiential feel so that we start to re educate our own community mm -hmm. about the idea that bespoke and real products would feel different. Mm -hmm. You know, glass and, and products that, that these wonderful craftspeople are doing. And then that also brings in the, the thought of where is manufacturing and artistry and art in our minds, the consumer and user cross or mm -hmm. integrate. Yeah. Um, uh, so Timbuktu, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. They have a they have a thing where they have a tiered thing like that where you can order a bespoke bag that's made in San Francisco and you can spec all the colors and spec all the options, right? right. Or you can buy the next level down, which is their mass-produced bags, which are actually sewn overseas uh, and not made locally here. But right. are they made with the same material? See, that's yeah. the point is I want the, the right. tactile No, they, they are. They are. It's still, it's still yeah. like, you know, one of them you get to customize like various options for color and that sort of thing, but, uh, and the other ones you don't. But it's, it's still the same design. 
mm -hmm. in the same bank. So there are some companies that are kind of doing a little bit of that, but not to the extent of, of what But can the nano entrepreneur do that? Is there an opportunity? Well, I, I'd like to speak to that specifically because it's one of the reasons why I kind of got into this. Um, and, and not necessarily related to the quality of materials of a product, say a, a super fine silk versus polyester or whatever. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about, about the form of these yes. things. Um, I use the cell phone as, a, as my example all the time, but um, this is just boring to me. <laughs> it's, a, it's a black uh, <laughs> rectangle, and seemingly everything else is too, with absolutely minimal variations. And um, I think that part of the reason why we're so willing to, to throw consumer objects away is that um, we don't have any sort of meaningful relationship with them anymore because they're all the same. Yeah. Um, they're they're sort of disposable in our minds because we can't we can't relate to them deeply. And so um, when I talk about this idea of having um, one-off products um, at a sort of mass manufacture price, yeah. um, that's exactly where the, the uh, nano entrepreneur or, or digital fabrication idea comes into play for me. That that. Um, you know, we can constantly churn out new form after new form after new form, and if we can make the guarantee to the, to the consumer that this is the only one of these that's ever been produced, but it's priced at, a, at an average consumer level, then what we're hoping is that people will make an adjustment to their consumption practices. Um, people will become much more attached to that one thing that they know will never be made again, and, and is never, has never been made anywhere else. It mm -hmm. becomes a sort of a keepsake. <coughs> and maybe that's a little bit more expensive than, than a plastic widget coming off the line and around a 5,000 or 100,000. Um, but we think that that's a, that's a really interesting opportunity to, to sort of use the new tools in a new way. And yeah. it might last four times longer. Exactly. Yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. That average computer, uh, consumer price is Right. Oh, absolutely, and we still totally struggle with that. I mean, our, our first products that we're trying to start this, this business with are going to be luxury market yeah. objects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I was the host coach for Low Income Nano Entrepreneurs for 10 years through Women's Initiative. Do you know who they are now? Which I'm really sad to miss say. You. You. Oh, <laughs> um, now, I, I, I teach for the integral MBA that Meridian has started at the uh, at the hub, um, but I I heard a, a a lot of things about the lack of labor, you know, the, that both of them talked about as I was working with people, and it's always made me curious about how we return the apprentice apprenticeship uh, program to uh, and change the. Um, change the valuing and the perspective about um, skilled labor work, you know, manual work, right? Has, because we have a service uh, focus now, almost exclusively, that uh, that seems to me like it has to change way early in education. So, so I'm curious about, this is kind of a two-pronged thing, curious about uh, moving that into the educational sphere, and if anybody knows of anything that's going on, and, uh, and then the other thing is I had a client who um, had this wonderful idea. She was, was re-educating her clients to be curators of their possessions, and because she had, she had a very beautiful handmade um, line of products, and uh, she said that it was really a complete psychological shift, you know. So it goes back to what you were talking about, about, you know, like treasuring something. And actually, I remember, I'm old enough to remember layaway. <laughs> yes, yes. And we used to see something and go in and put $10 down on it and then pay for it over a period of time and then wear that for years and years, yes. you know, yeah. a special wool coat or something like that. that right. you know, like how, how do we bring that back That's into exactly the consciousness like of process? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. Something, yeah. So, so anything that, that you're seeing, because I never hear anything about reskilling 
you know, uh, on, on a large right. scale, other than transition town kind of movement. Right. So we yes. have some so bringing a yeah. way of um, We're listening sustaining to. yourself financially through the journey of being a journeyman, right? Right. So yes. There's that mm -hmm. aspect right. of it. So I'm working with the city of Oakland right now to launch, to formally um, uh, launch mm -hmm. and develop Oakland Makers, which is a nonprofit organization, and we have 400 members right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the education and equity working group of this organization is looking exactly at that. And, you know, how do we work with high schools? And um, Laney College is involved. They have actually one of the top-notch manufacturing uh, certification programs in the area. Um, and we recognize that manufacturing is onshoring. It is coming back here. And, you know, in America, as it always has been, um, you know, innovation is a huge piece. It's really managing the production part of it and being able to create uh, good living wage, uh, good livelihood jobs out of that. Right. For people locally, too. For people for locally. For historic residents. So you can say made in Oakland, you know, but I want to be able to say bought by Oaklanders, too. <laughs> you yeah. know, because... That is the part where if we can reframe, again, making, you know, marketing sort of more about educational movements and uh, practices, I, don't, I can't tell you how many people will be like, oh, you know, I would rather, because now money is tight or scarce, I would much rather, you know, um, save my money and buy something that's going to last me longer that's like a timeless design, for example. It's not beholden to, you know, the fashion cycle where the the fashion machine is saying, oh, no, you need that disposable garment that, you know, is out of fashion in two months, you know. Um, I don't know. I, there, there are efforts, and we're trying to link um, open makers, actually, our core group, and we just did a, completed a survey. 60% of our members are willing to open their doors, their, their maker spaces, their manufacturing uh, facilities to youth. To be able to say, you know, let's bring kids in, expose them to the fact that you can actually make a living while making things, by the way. And what about the connection to your hands and being able to make things? Because we've stripped that from our schools. There is no workshop, right? I mean, Castlemont, you know, with Danny Beasley, and I think he's been another workshop right now. They're setting up fab labs, the whole STEM educational uh, paradigm. That's starting to come back and there's a national recognition for manufacturing so it's, it's happening. That's absolutely where it has to start because um, the, the drain has already taken place. Um, I have electricians working in my shop installing some ceiling fans. They, they were born and raised in Oakland. They live in San Leandro now because they can't afford to live in Oakland. Who, who do you think is working in all the service in all the restaurants around here? Do you think they live in Oakland? A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't live in Oakland because they can't afford to. So unless we can train people out of high school and create jobs for them in the local community, we're going to lose them. They're going to lose something else. Mm -hmm. Europe is, is much better at doing that. And they've been criticized, too, of tracking kids in middle school or something yeah. like that. There was, there was an article in the Sunday New York Times travel section about um, treasures around the world, and it focused on, you know, in Prague they make toys, and in Italy it's glass or, or whatever, and, and all these cities have a, have a kind of a trademark trade, if you will, uh, that's tied to art in the local community. Well, what's all going to be? Um, you mentioned man. You mentioned marketing, and you sort of used a, a forty to fifty dollar T shirt as an example for how you can, uh, you know, somehow um, use marketing to convince someone. Uh, and you know, my my I, I, I'm actually in marketing, and, and my my initial reaction is skepticism uh, at that level. I mean, it depends on what the object is that the person. You know, there are there are definitely. I feel like there are definitely objects and services products and services that people would be willing to pay more for. We're talking about like the great mass of people, not these elite people who right. can only afford luxury items. And what I hear a lot, you know, when I, I, I love, you know, 
hearing about the new economy and everything, but so often it does seem as if the new economy, just based on what technology is available now, it's really going to be available. These, these private services are only available for the same elite people who can afford this stuff anyway. It's very, it's, I, I find it highly unlikely that anyone is going to be willing, at least at the level that we're talking about, the mass economy is going to be paying, it's going to be hard to convince people that paying $50 for a t-shirt, regardless of where it's made, is, is worth it. But, you know, it depends, but, but, but paying, you know, but a nice coat, you know, something that, they, where there's a sort of inherent value, something that they know will last a long time. I think that's where you have to start, like, sort of segmenting out what is it that's going to, what makes sense, and what do you, what is it that's going to make sense for someone to pay maybe slightly more for, um, you know, uh, that you can maybe educate them and convince them to do that. And then looking at other things and thinking, well, okay, you know what, that's probably not, that's probably not going to happen. You know, you have to be kind of focused, I think, on what you, what you're trying to re-educate people about. It's, 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 a really, long, it's a really hard dilemma yeah. because, um, you know, with the layaway example, I mean, if we could get to every object that is <laughs> reflecting, you know, the true cost mm -hmm. of its making, regardless of where it's made, and, you know, I mean, I can't afford to buy the things that are produced in my collective. I really can't. Thank goodness for trade and barter, you know, um, which is another consideration. But, you know, to actually be able to have a hand in the, co like, a co-creation model, I think, might make a difference for a t-shirt. Because yeah. Yeah. I, I've talked to many people in dire situations um, financially that say, you know what, I would rather, s I would rather spend $10 over, you know, four months and get that item as opposed to, and, and waiting. I mean, the whole other thing with America, too, is like trying to teach delayed gratification. Yeah. How do you yeah. that? I mean, that's a cultural shift, and cultural shifts are really difficult to, you know, they, they happen over a, a period of time, or there's something that happens, and then all of a sudden there's a massive change because it just has to happen. So those are the kinds of things you have to be considering. And I also think that we should be looking at technology to bring costs down. There's no reason why, you know, right now we're looking at new technology, looking at 3D printers, they are expensive, but, you know, eventually they won't be, you know, and then that's when you're going to be able to see that we can use this bespoke, this technology to create these bespoke items and these, these services that, you know, can actually be affordable by, you know, by people. Right now this is a moment in time, and yes, it's expensive, and we're looking at it in this, you know, this paradigm, but the paradigm has to change. It has to still be affordable. Um, one of the oh, what, sorry, one no. of the things that I've seen in the apparel industry that has really changed um, is educating the consumer on where all these goods mm -hmm. are being produced. So I think being very transparent, I saw a company, I believe they're based out of Emeryville, mm -hmm. who basically released their tech packs and their technical sketches and their so buy instructions to the consumer, which is really unheard of because people are afraid that you know, right. the next designer is going to knock it off. Right. And I think that type of education to the consumer is really going to be key so that the consumer understands, oh, I'm purchasing these and paying a higher premium because of X, Y, and Z. And, you know, that kind of just trickles down and creates um, higher paying livable wages. Right. And it, so I think if this whole movement of transparency from designers is something that's going to um, play a key role in and um, consumers being, you know, willing to pay for a, a cheaper or a less expensive item like a t-shirt and yeah. paying a, a premium. Right. I think I can see somebody paying like, you know, instead of paying say five or ten dollars, I could see another five or ten dollars on top of it. What I would I have a, you know, like like in the near future, what I struggle with is paying four or five, six, seven times the cost of what they're used to paying. And that I think is a larger dilemma, and I I, I think that you have to use all kinds of you know, mechanisms, education, and whatnot, but you also have to use technology to bring that cost in line with what the consumers want. Yeah. Um, so I used to talk about the that one. I have a specific question, about, because I'm not familiar with any kind of manufacturing at all. Mm -hmm. Because when you mention these machines and you yeah. say they can make things, yeah. I'm curious what they can make. Oh. Um, but I also mm -hmm. want to say about the t-shirt issue is, in fact, people pay, you know, like $80 yeah. for a t-shirt that has a little name attached yeah. to it. Yeah. And so I think that there is this mass exploitation of image that's being done that mm -hmm. go for quality and ethical practices. Well, that's actually
actually, yeah, that's, to, to, if, if I can, just what you, the second point you had. That's one of the things that I think that the smaller manufacturers have on their side that the larger manufacturers and the larger companies don't, is I know when we're selling like furniture products to people, what they're buying is they're buying, like it's a different value, right? Um, there's a different story attached to the object because we don't have the uh, legal war chest to keep a large company from knocking off our designs and just copying them and selling them anyway. Like, you know, uh, a larger retailer like Urban Outfitters or something could pick up one of our designs, copy it, and sell it, and there's really nothing we can do. Right? People say, oh, you could copyright your design, you could do this, you could do that, but the reality is, is that you have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to, you know, or more, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some instances. So, but what we do have as a smaller maker is we have that connection directly to the customer where we can make something that they really, really <laughs> love and that they're going to value enough to want to pay that that extra that we can't make the thing for 10 bucks, you know, it's going to be more than that. But we have it on our side where we can do things like open our design, you know, where it's like fully open, you know, the, like where they can modify it or do some more. Like, there's a lot of things the that we can do. manufacturing happening when you walk into the retail store. Right, exactly. Where you, or where you can even be part of that process if you want to be. So there's a lot of interesting, like, new value things that can be brought to the table that a bigger company just simply can't do for a variety of reasons. So, um, but also that I want like what can you make? Like I have all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Why don't you touch base with us when, when this is oh, over? Oh, okay. Because that world is so broad <laughs> that uh, we could be here for another like five hours talking about just that topic. So you all the way in the back. Um, I have a kind of like two kind of questions built into one. Um, have you ever explored accepting like a percentage of the sales price in local currency to kind of lower the dollar price? And then also um, say for certain designs, kind of doing like a group buy, like if, if enough people purchase a certain amount, that price goes down because you, you know, making it about the value? Well, it, there, is, there is a model like that, uh, Gustin jeans, that they sell their jeans and they, uh, you know, they get a pre-fund and pre-orders and, and, they, and they get a pair of jeans, a pair of jeans, a pair of jeans for, oh, I don't know, $100, something like that. Could you speak up, please? Yeah. That? There's a model like that now, um, Gustin Jeans in San Francisco, and they're, they're funded, they make, um, they, they raise money uh, by getting pre-orders for their jeans on Kickstarter or something like that, and, uh, and so on. But what, what you lose there is, is in, in the process, is that you're, you're taking away the, the, the custom aspect of that clothing in effect. Uh, because you're getting one design, um, yeah, one fit, and it, it's it, it takes away the cachet of of the small the small batch production. I think where um, a regular producer, I say a regular a small manufacturer, can produce a few different fits and find one that's particularly good for a person. Does that make sense? Yeah. How about the local currency aspect? Have you ever I think you have explored that. Open to it, absolutely. I haven't explored it. So I know we had some more, more questions in the back there. We don't have that much time left, and just a really quick thing to jump in. Uh, when the session is over, uh, I guess they're reconfiguring um, some stuff out there, so if we can actually wait in here while they're doing that, but they're going to bring us cookies. <laughs> or at least that's the note that just said that I got. So I, I cannot personally promise cookies, but this note says that there's cookies on the way. So, uh, so anyway, there's a couple questions back there. Uh, how about you? Yeah. And, um, then, and then you behind. Yeah. I just wanted to build a bit of a bridge to one of the conversations yesterday about money. And i um, wondering how you were all able, if you're willing to share, how you were able to finance um, to start your businesses and then, or, and or, what kinds of financing do you feel like would let you move to the next stage? Is that a barrier? And if so, kind of what kinds of financing do you feel like are needed in this space? Well, I can, I can start off on that one really easily. So in uh, 2005, my wife and I bought a CNC router, and it was from a company that had just started. They, don't, they were only <coughs> probably four or five years old at that point. They started right around 2000. Um, making accessible, affordable CNC routers. So uh, there's a company called ShopBot out of North Carolina. And normally a CNC router was something that cost fifty to $100,000 um, and was meant for like high volume cabinet shops where it was going to be running like 24-7 just churning out boring cabinets to pay for itself. Or you would use them to make like parts for airplanes. 
uh, and that was the only way that you could afford to pay for the machine was by making either like lots of volume of goods or making really high margin goods on the desk. There was nothing in the middle, right? So these guys come out with a CNC router where they're like, well, okay, it's not nearly as fancy as the $50,000 model. Uh, it's more like the Volkswagen bug. Um, of CNC routers, right? Like you have to you have to keep a close eye on it. You got to fix it all the time, but it will run pretty well and it will do its job pretty well and it's very dependable. And like, um, and so that's the Shopbox Corporation. And so we bought one of them in 2005, and we were able to buy one. They had a special deal at the time because they were discontinuing this model, so we were able to get one for around seven thousand dollars. So my wife and I aren't by any means wealthy. Uh, you know, we're both working as designers, which doesn't pay you know a huge amount, but we were able to just save up the money. And we were living in a live workspace in West Oakland that was really cheap. Buy it, put it in the bottom, and just start making stuff. And screw up a lot, and have a lot of <laughs> accidents, and mistakes, and you know, make stuff for friends and friends of friends. And then next thing you know, like two years later, we have to quit our day jobs and just do that. And we've grown, and now we're up to like six people. We have two CNC routers now. We're renting a big warehouse in West Oakland. And, you know, we're growing along that way. So we were able to start really organically uh, and not have to take on loans or go into debt or anything. Um, which gave us a lot of runway to, to figure out how to make money and how to get off the ground. Um, but that was just that was just my experience in that. Thing, so. and, and we're trying to do it the same exact way. I mean, I think I mentioned a little bit ago that we we got a MakerBot, and then it was like, oh, we should have a business to go with this MakerBot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's totally not what's happening. And, and, um, <laughs> you know, we spend a little bit of money, but we want to we want to grow as our sales grow. Um, we have this kind of um, repulsion towards towards these companies that are that are valued at, at two two and a half million dollars after a year with no product and no customers, and we just think that no that profit. is and no profits, yeah. and, and and we think that that's just all hoo ha. Um, we we want to to sort of make real things that have real value and sell them to real people and and, um, and we want to let that grow or yeah like but a novel business model right <laughs> <laughs> so how did yeah how did you get how how did, how did you get started bootstrap bootstrap yeah yeah same sort of thing right or yeah and yeah yeah indeed and 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 you guys as well or um, yeah I self-funded my company so it was a little bit different for me because I was a service business that I was going to start um, in the mm -hmm. pattern making mm -hmm. portion of it so all I needed was pencils, paper, a table right. and that's about it and my skill as a pattern maker but um, after I branched out and moved from my home office into a commercial space and hired my first employee I kept a part time job for about two years and I just made sure that I um, saved and now I have a good cushion saved. I left that, you know, when I felt the time was right and um, I've done it that way. Uh, with my blanket company, I had an SBA loan to just purchase initial inventory. Um, with the 25th Street Collective, it was a lot of creative negotiation with the landlord and increasing the rent over time as I brought business owners in. I also obtained, um, well, I first started by structuring it as an L3C and registering in Vermont. So we're not an LLC, we're technically a no-profit, for-profit, we've just, you know, been almost barely cash positive, but to get that designation, you know, you're providing education and workshops, this is, there's a different mission there. Um, and so just kind of moving forward the whole hybrid model of a for-benefit company, I think is something that's sort of at the core of our, our you know, um, goal there. Um, but the redevelopment agency <coughs> of the city of Oakland, when it was still in existence, gave us uh, some money to hand build some wooden shelves on wheels that helped define the different sort of retail spaces, and that was, that was a big help. There are places like uh, the Renaissance Entrepreneurship Center um, mm -hmm. in San Francisco. They have a financial advisor there. 
sometimes what happens though is as you get to your goal of ten or whatever thousand um, dollars, a bank might come in 